This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Peterson, Massa Martana, Italy. A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 6 A Fight That Won Friends. The thing which more nearly resembled our earthly men than it did the Martians I had seen held me pinioned to the ground with one huge foot while it jabbered and gesticulated at some answering creature behind me. This other, which was evidently its mate, soon came toward us bearing a mighty stone cudgel with which it evidently intended to brain me. The creatures were about ten or fifteen feet tall, standing erect, and had, like the green Martians, an intermediary set of arms or legs midway between their upper and lower limbs. Their eyes were close together and non-protruding. Their ears were high-set, but more laterally located than those of the Martians, while their snouts and teeth were strikingly like those of our African gorilla. Altogether they were not unlovely when viewed in comparison with the green Martians. The cudgel was swinging in the arc which ended upon my upturned face when a bolt of myriad-legged horror hurled itself through the doorway full upon the breast of my executioner. With a shriek of fear the ape which held me leaped through the open window, but its mate closed in a terrific death-struggle with my preserver, which was nothing less than my faithful watch-thing. I cannot bring myself to call so hideous a creature a dog. As quickly as possible I gained my feet, and backing against the wall I witnessed such a battle as it is vouchsafed few beings to see. The strength, agility, and blind ferocity of these two creatures is approached by nothing known to earthly man. My beast had an advantage in his first hold, having sunk his mighty fangs far into the breast of his adversary, but the great arms and paws of the ape, backed by muscles far transcending those of the Martian men I had seen, had locked the throat of my guardian and slowly were choking out his life and bending back his head and neck upon his body, where I momentarily expected the former to fall limp at the end of a broken neck. In accomplishing this, the ape was tearing away the entire front of its breast, which was held in the vice-like grip of the powerful jaws. Back and forth upon the floor they rolled, neither one emitting a sound of fear or pain. Presently I saw the great eyes of my beast bulging completely from their sockets and blood flowing from its nostrils. That he was weakening perceptibly was evident, but so also was the ape, whose struggles were growing momentarily less. Suddenly I came to myself, and with that strange instinct which seems ever to prompt me to duty, I seized the cudgel which had fallen to the floor at the commencement of the battle, and swinging it with all the power of my earthly arms, I crashed it full upon the head of the ape, crushing his skull as though it had been an eggshell. Scarcely had the blow descended when I was confronted with a new danger. The ape's mate, recovered from its first shock of terror, had returned to the scene of the encounter by way of the interior of the building. I glimpsed him just before he reached the doorway, and the sight of him, now roaring as he perceived his lifeless fellow stretched upon the floor, and frothing at the mouth in the extremity of his rage, filled me, I must confess, with dire forebodings. I am ever willing to stand and fight when the odds are not too overwhelmingly against me, but in this instance I perceived neither glory nor profit in, pity, in pitting my relatively puny strength against the iron muscles and brutal ferocity of this enraged denizen of an unknown world. In fact, the only outcome of such an encounter, so far as I might be concerned, seemed sudden death. I was standing near the window, and I knew that once in the street I might gain the plaza and safety before the creature could overtake me. At least there was a chance for safety in flight. 
against almost certain death should I remain and fight, however desperately. It is true I held the cudgel, but what could I do with it against his four great arms? Even should I break one of them with my first blow, for I figured that he would attempt to ward off the cudgel, he could reach out and annihilate me with the others before I could recover for a second attack. In the instant that these thoughts passed through my mind I had turned to make for the window, but my eyes alighting on the form of my erstwhile guardian threw all thoughts of flight to the four winds. He lay gasping upon the floor of the chamber, his great eyes fastened upon me in what seemed a pitiful appeal for protection. I could not withstand that look, nor could I, on second thought, have deserted my rescuer without giving as good an account of myself in his behalf as he had in mind. Without more ado, therefore, I turned to meet the charge of the infuriated bull ape. He was now too close upon me for the cudgel to prove of any effective assistance, so I merely threw it as heavily as I could at his advancing bulk. It struck him just below the knees, eliciting a howl of pain and rage, and so throwing him off his balance that he lunged full upon me with arms wide stretched to ease his fall. Again, as on the preceding day, I had recourse to earthly tactics, and swinging my right fist full upon the point of his chin, I followed it with a smashing left to the pit of his stomach. The effect was marvelous, for as I lightly sidestepped after delivering the second blow, he reeled and fell upon the floor doubled up with pain and gasping for wind. Leaping over his prostrate body, I seized the cudgel and finished the monster before he could regain his feet. As I delivered the blow, a low laugh rang out behind me, and turning, I beheld Tars Tarkas, Sola, and three or four warriors standing in the doorway of the chamber. As my eyes met theirs, I was, for the second time, the recipient of their gar zealously guarded applause. My absence had been noted by Sola on her awakening, and she had quickly informed Tars Tarkas, who had set out immediately with a handful of warriors to search for me. As they had approached the limits of the city, they had witnessed the actions of the bull ape as he bolted into the building, frothing with rage. They had followed immediately behind him, thinking it barely possible that his actions might provide a clue to where my whereabouts, and had witnessed my short but decisive battle with him. This encounter, together with my set-to with a Martian warrior on the previous day, and my feats of jumping, placed me on a high pinnacle in their regard. Evidently devoid of all the finer sentiments of friendship, love, or affection, these people fairly worship physical prowess and bravery, and nothing is too good for the object of their adoration, as long as he maintains his position by repeated examples of his skill, strength, and courage. Sola, who had accompanied the searching party of her own volition, was the only one of the Martians whose face had not been twisted in laughter as I battled for my life. She, on the contrary, was sober with apparent solicitude, and as soon as I had finished the monster, rushed to me and carefully examined my body for possible wounds or injuries. Satisfying herself that I had come off unscathed, she smiled quietly, and, taking my hand, started toward the door of the chamber. Tars Tarkas and the other warriors had entered, and were standing over the now rapidly reviving brute which had saved my life, and whose life I, in return, had rescued. They seemed to be deep in argument, and finally one of them addressed me, but remembering my ignorance of his language, turned back to Tars Tarkas, who with a word and a gesture gave some command to the fellow, and turned to follow us from the room. There seemed something menacing in their attitude toward my beast, and I hesitated to leave until I had learned the outcome. It was well I did so, for the warrior drew an evil-looking pistol from its holster, and was on the point of putting an end to the creature when I sprang forward and struck up his arm. The bullet striking the wooden casing of the window exploded, blowing a hole completely through the wood and masonry. 
I then knelt down beside the fearsome-looking thing, and raising it to its feet, motioned for it to follow me. The looks of surprise which my actions elicited from the Martians were ludicrous. They could not understand, except in a feeble and childish way, such attributes as gratitude and compassion. The warrior whose gun I had struck up looked inquiringly at Tars Tarkas, but the latter signed that I be left to my own devices, and so we returned to the plaza, with my great beast following close at heel, and Sola grasping me tightly by the arm. I had at least two friends on Mars, a young woman who watched over me with motherly solicitude, and a dumb brute which, as I later came to know, held in its poor, ugly carcass more love, more loyalty, more gratitude than could have been found in the entire five million green Martians who rove the deserted cities and dead sea-bottoms of Mars. End of chapter 6